summer concerts, pool parties, chill nights under the stars. We're stocking up our closet so you're ready to look your best for all of it. At Plato's Closet in West Ashley and North Charleston, we're buying all things summer. So bring in your tees, tote bags, sandals, sunglasses, and more. We pay cash on the spot for gently loved name brand looks. Plato's Closet is the go-to destination for trend-forward teens and young adults who support local and shop sustainable. Visit Plato's Closet today. Plato's Closet, located in West Ashley on Sam Rittenberg Boulevard and North Charleston on Rivers Avenue. Uh, it's tell show returning guest he was on radio he hadn't done video yet so now you get to see him live and in person if you're on the youtube channel uh mr pelican not just because he's an nba fan but he comes from the pelican institute down here young voices contributor writing all over the place really sharp guy uh eric peterson how are you sir i'm doing good man uh pelicans had a close game last night but uh i'm looking forward to some games uh this weekend yeah, it's uh, always good when they're playing games down there. Because last time I really talked to you, you were running from yet another storm down there. So good to see you're sconched back in and all's well down there, my friend. Yeah, absolutely. We're getting ready for Mardi Gras. Exciting time down here in New Orleans. Yeah, I, uh, I had to do a, one of my first TDYs. I had to go down to Alexandria for and we uh, snuck up to Mardi Gras. So it's an interesting experience love for it. sure. There's some weird folks in Sin Law. We love you all, <laughs> but I'm. I'm I'm talking about a West Virginian who was stationed in Arkansas who got sent to Sin Law. Uh, there's some weird folk down there, but we love you dearly as Americans. All right, buddy. Uh, normally we have a real fair conversation because you're a super sharp guy. I try to read up and be informed. I'm just going to tell you up front, you're going to do a lot of explaining to me like I'm five because I don't understand this stuff, even though I try really, really hard. Um, you're a Bitcoin guy. You're a Bitcoin proponent. Mm-hmm. Bitcoin's had a rough couple of days on the market, which means they've had some really rough days in the press, media, and headlines. Uh, turn down the noise for us, though. What's really going on with Bitcoin? What happened the last couple of days? And is it panic time or is this just a market fluctuation? Because you see those big numbers, everybody kind of freaks out. What's actually going on here? Yeah, I mean, I don't think there's any uh, reason to freak out about it. The folks that are invested in Bitcoin and continue to mine Bitcoin um, continue to believe in Bitcoin. So the sort of underlying structure um, uh, of the asset or currency, um, I don't think it's changing at all. A lot of what this is response to is uh, Russia talking about potentially banning Bitcoin and Bitcoin mining. Uh, They've stepped that back a little bit and said, well, maybe we just will regulate it. Um, and obviously, the, the rest of the broader market has been down as well. So um, there's just been a broader market sell-off combined with a little bit of uh, geopolitical uncertainty. Um, you know, but as, of the last few days, it's, it's already you know, catching back up at the price. And um, if you look at, it, at, the, at the sort of year long, uh, it is still up. So I, I don't think it's uh, much of a concern for those in the Bitcoin community. Unpack that for just a second, because we know Russia is a tyrannical government. We know Putin's yeah. a thug dictator. He's one of the wicked people on the planet. We're not going to uh, we're not going to sugarcoat that for anybody. Why would Russia want to ban Bitcoin? We know it's a control thing first and foremost, but we also understand Russia's run by oligarchs. It's run by a small group of people who have a lot of shady finances. You'd think they'd want Bitcoin being around, or is this just straight a control thing? That doesn't make sense just looking at it. Why would Russia and China's talked about the same thing as well and other dictatorships? Why are they against Bitcoin so much? Yeah, I mean, the the real value of Bitcoin, right, is that it allows people like you and me to have financial transactions without a trusted third party. So we don't need a bank. Um, Now, of course, that transaction is available for everyone to see on the blockchain, uh, but a government can't put pressure on Bitcoin and stop that transaction from taking place. So uh, great for people like you and me who live in different states and might want to buy or sell something online, but especially important for countries like Russia or China um, who want to have greater economic control over what um, you know, their citizens are allowed to do, say, purchase, anything like that. Now, the common pushback, I'll just put it to you directly. You're a stand-up guy. You tell me how you answer this question. Uh, the pushback is there's a lot of nefarious stuff in here. There's some money laundering involved, these sorts of things with Bitcoin, because if there's no government involvement, there's no government oversight. You talked about the positive side of that, but there is a negative side to that. How do you answer concerns with that when people bring it up about Bitcoin? Yeah, there's a few different ways to answer it. Um, you know, I know I'm sure a lot of your uh, listeners or viewers right now are familiar with the Colonial Pipeline attack. Um, they had a big ransomware incident 
um, they were actually able to retrieve a, a lot of that ransom uh, because of the way the Bitcoin uh, network works, right? Every transaction is logged and you can see where that uh, Bitcoin is flowing to. Now, you know, there's not necessarily a name associated with every account, but it does provide the opportunity for law enforcement uh, if they're technically sophisticated and, you know, law enforcement is getting more technically sophisticated all the time um, to start to deal with some of those bad actors, uh, much more so than if people are dealing with $100 bills in cash, which has uh, traditionally been the uh, currency for, you know, the international drug trade or international arms trade or, or just sort of nefarious activities across the globe. Yeah, and uh, Bitcoin's lighter than Hundies. Uh, talking to Eric Peterson, uh, a little bit of Bitcoin and rapidly evolving technology in money markets. All right, another pushback on Bitcoin is that the mining itself is an issue, how they actually get this. You actually were posting on your social media. You just had a meeting about this with folks where you were actually talking about it, not in a negative way, but as Bitcoin mining should be considered part of infrastructure. There's our word of the year that we've been talking so much about. <laughs> Um, environmental people push back against this. There's also uh, people economically push back against it because of the structure. Explain to folks what Bitcoin mining actually is. Give us the nomenclature before we get into the, the pros and cons of how they actually do this process. Yeah, the, the most basic thing to understand about mining is, is Bitcoin works by a bunch of computers um, working together to keep the network up and running. So if you and I want to send Bitcoin to each other, we need somebody else's computer to do, log that transaction for us. Um, that, of course, takes two big inputs. One is computer devices and uh, energy. Uh, I mean, there, there's no doubt that it, it uses a lot of energy, uh, but so do a lot of things we use, you know, Christmas lights, our traditional financial system, you know, us doing stuff over Zoom right now, um, all, all takes energy. So, but the, the Bitcoin mining industry uh, cares a lot about low energy prices and about reaching a lot of stranded energy. Uh, you know, Louisiana is a big oil and gas state. Uh, a state like North Dakota, right? Big oil and gas state. Uh, when they're pumping oil out of the ground, they uh, produce natural gas. Most of that stuff doesn't have pipelines to get to market. So there's a company in Louisiana, right? That'll take that natural gas and rather than it having being flared off into the atmosphere, creating more carbon dioxide, they're able to convert it to electricity and use that uh, to mine Bitcoin. Now there are examples like this all across the world, people using stuff like hydro, nuclear, um, you know, finding stranded energy assets, uh, to, to, you know, mine Bitcoin. So I don't think it's fair to just look at this total overall energy usage. We don't do that for most of the things that we work with. Um, I, I think it comes down to a lot of the criticism about the energy usage of Bitcoin is they don't like Bitcoin uh, to begin with. And this is an avenue of attack um, on the currency. You had that meeting, uh, you tweeted, tweeted, <laughs> Twitter, you tweeted the <laughs> picture of all y'all sitting around the table talking about it. That's a room full of people that are very invested in Bitcoin, obviously, with the headlines that's been going on. Just kind of what was the mood as you have, you know, a group of peers of people that really know what's going on with this? What's their overall feel of where Bitcoin is? We know the bad headlines. We know that, you know, governments are looking at it. We know there's a lot of people against it. Yet y'all, and I mean, Bitcoin proponents, you seem uh, infinitely optimistic about the future of the monetary currency of Bitcoin. Yeah, I mean, I think there's a lot of excitement in that room. Um, specifically, that meeting was about how we can get Louisiana to the forefront of Bitcoin mining. Um, we look at states like Wyoming, Florida, and Texas, um, where they're you know mining a ton of Bitcoin. They have a ton of investment. They're creating a lot of jobs. And um, Louisiana, being the sort of uh, resource-rich state that it is, uh, you know, we're asking ourselves, why not us? What can we do to change that? And I think you know it starts first with education, and then looking at uh, you know any government policies that might be in the way. Uh, you know, perfectly reasonable regulations that just weren't, you know, written for something like Bitcoin to be on the market. Yeah, talking to Eric Peterson. Uh, now, on a practical level, one thing that I did like, even though I don't really understand all the Bitcoin mining part of this, is the places they're trying to do this. Uh, there's been talk of reusing uh, otherwise unused industrial areas. There's been programs where they take over old power plants. Uh, those types of facilities, because they have the hardened infrastructure like power lines, like uh, availability that is necessary to put those massive, I guess, server farms is kind of the best way to explain yeah. it. Um, so for areas that have that are post industrial and it doesn't really matter where they are, as long as they got power lines and an Internet connection. We talk so much about small town America and middle city America and Rust Belt America being post industrial, trying to find something next. This seems like something you could put into some of those industrial areas and get a little bit of economic activity going. Yes. 
Yeah, I mean, I think absolutely. We have a, a great mining company uh, in Louisiana building these sorts of rigs, and uh, they send them to all over the world. But you have, um, you know, just areas where people have stranded power assets, um, you know, they have something that's shut down, they have a, a plant that wouldn't be profitable, uh, but is generating a lot of electricity, they bring in a Bitcoin miner, and then they can switch up the economics of the whole situation. Um, the most exciting thing I think about Bitcoin, because it's so decentralized and a worldwide thing, um, it, it can basically go anywhere. And uh, that means economic growth uh, is, is available to all parts of the country and the world, quite frankly. Yeah, talking to Eric Peterson. One more thing about this Bitcoin before we move on. Um, you have mentioned it. I've heard other people mention it. Um, what kind of economic impact are we talking? Because we talk about government being a, against Bitcoin. Uh, we've seen this movie, so we know how this goes. Uh, that means they don't know exactly how to monetize it for the government yet. Uh, where do you see this going policy-wise with things like regulation, with things like zoning, with things like taxes? Because honestly, if the government can tax it, they're going to be more okay with it. That's kind of where I think policy-wise a lot of this is going. Do you agree with that? And where do you think this is going in the future to kind of normalize Bitcoin? Yeah, I mean, it's a great question. I would say when I look at the future regulation for Bitcoin, at least in this country, I see a lot of buy-in at the state level, right? You see places like Texas, Florida, Wyoming. Um, they're leaders in this industry, and I, I think that will prevent or provide a buffer over Congress or the executive branch uh, sort of overstepping its bounds the way that Russia or China did. Um, that said, in, in some ways, you know, regulating Bitcoin is, I don't want to say almost impossible, but it's, it's very difficult. And so when you have you know, countries like China or Iran or you know, El Salvador or Turkey, or I'm sorry, El Salvador's pro Bitcoin, um, like Venezuela or Turkey, uh, try to clamp down on Bitcoin. I think that's where Bitcoin is most valuable. It's sort of hard to explain to somebody in America that has a re relatively well working financial system, even with inflation. We're not dealing with hyperinflation. The value of Bitcoin, um, but you know, it's really in those places that Bitcoin has its greatest value. Yeah, talking to Eric Peterson, uh, a little bit about Bitcoin, a little bit about technology. When we come back, he's got an interesting piece where he explains. NFTs. Yeah, you've been seeing them all over your social media feeds. You don't know what it is. I don't know what it is. He's going to explain it to us like we're five and get us walked through. It's going to use a sports analogy to try to explain it. We'll get into that right after this on Herd Tell. Hertel, we're back with Eric Peterson, Young Voices contributor. He's from the Pelican Institute. He's one of them Louisiana folks down there uh, who we love, but we like when they come visit and then leave because they're a little off in the center, but we love you guys. We're just playing with you. Um, all right. We already talked about Bitcoin. One thing that folks don't understand real well, you have written a piece over in TechDirt, which is a cool little website that I've used before. Uh, NFTs. Uh, before we get into the piece, though, I think people just see it online. They're like, why are you paying for a clip art picture of something else? They don't understand it. So let's just work on the nomenclature right off the bat, Eric. What yeah. is an NFT on a basic level before we delve into this further? Yeah, an NFT just means non-fungible token. Uh, essentially, that just means something that is irreplaceable. It's, it's one of a kind. Um, the best way I, I think of describing it is something like um, art, right? If you go to a new museum, you can see a piece of art. Um, you know, it's behind all that glass. You know, you can't touch it. It's worth millions of dollars. Uh, but you can go into the gift shop and buy a perfectly good copy of that for you know thirty bucks and hang it up um, in your house. Uh, NFTs sort of work the opposite way, right? Uh, you know, you get a perfect copy of a JPEG on the internet. I can send it to you. You can send it to me. Um, the non-fungible part comes in, we talk about blockchain technology, a little bit where we were talking before with Bitcoin. Um, all it is, is basically an ownership certificate. It would say that you and Andrew own uh, this particular JPEG. Nobody else can own it. And everybody else can see that you have ownership claims over it. That's the breakdown, though, because I'm like, OK, but it's still just a picture of a picture. Like that's that's where people just have trouble getting to. How does that have any value other than just what you say it has value? But I think you had an interesting way of dealing with that in this piece because you tie it to and make an analogy 
two sports memorabilia, which is the same thing, whereas you could have a Babe Ruth signed baseball. That would mean a lot to a baseball fan, but to somebody in another part of the world who doesn't know who Babe Ruth is, that's just a ball. So explain it that way, the way you kind of laid it out in your piece, because I think that's an interesting way to kind of get into it and let people maybe get their arms around it where it's so, you know, out there in the ether of, oh, well, it's this and this and it's a picture of a picture. Explain it that way to folks and let them try to get their mind around it. Yeah, I mean, human beings put ownership or value on all sorts of really interesting things, like you said, autographs, um, you know, a, a, a jersey, right? A game seven worn jersey, right? It, at the end of the day, it's just a jersey. It has a use value, but it has sentimental value because of the history behind it. Um, in the same way, an NFT tries to put history around something that's that's digital, um, something that we can't necessarily tangibly hold on to, um, and and that's the value for it. And you know. Because it's on the blockchain, everybody can see that I have ownership of that. There's no dispute of it. Um, you know, it without the blockchain technology, again, I could create this great piece of art online. Say I'm the creator of it, uh, but it would get shared around to you know a few million people, and, and nobody would be able to verify that. And there sort of goes the the value um, that human beings place on having a, a unique copy of something. Right, and then in your piece but you brought it up. It is decentralized. So then the, the counterpoint to that is always going to be, well, because it's decentralized, how do you enforce ownership on something that's by its own very nature decentralized? I know we can go on the logs and look at it on the blockchain, yep. Yep. but it, this stuff doesn't have a uh, tort law attached to it yet. There's no way to really, it hadn't been tested in court of who has ownership and suing people and this sort of thing. So that part of it is the pushback of, do you really own it if you can't enforce it? Yeah, I, so it, it's a good question, right? Um, I, I want to be very clear that NFTs are not copyright, um, right? I, I can't buy an NFT of a piece of work and say that nobody else can ever, uh, you know, copy the JPEG or use it. Um, what it is is that I can provide some claim of ownership on the blockchain. Um, it's a lot of way. It, it's the same way that um, uh, you know, rich people buy you know art and hang it up in the house. The difference between again me buying a $50 perfect replica of a piece of art and hanging up in my house and somebody paying millions of dollars to hang it up in a museum. Makes sense. Uh, Eric Peterson, Pelican Institute, Young Voices contributor joining us. All right. Another one of those kind of analogies though is of ownership is people buy stock in things. Uh, uh -huh. You get a piece of paper for the wall. You use a sports metaphor for this or an analogy, I should say, of uh, the Green Bay Packers, because some folks that aren't sports ball enthusiasts may not know the Green Bay Packers are actually publicly owned. You can buy a share in the Green Bay Packers, and you use that to try to explain some of this NFT stuff as well. Yeah, uh, I'm currently a very uh, suffering Packers fan. Uh, last weekend was not good. Uh, but despite that, I'm very proud of how the Packers are owned. Like you said, it's public ownership. Um, they provide an opportunity. Um, it's been about every decade or so for fans to go off and buy Packers stock. Um, you know, in a lot of ways, it's like an NFT. It's a piece of paper that I, I put up on the wall. It has a certificate number of it. Um, but it does grant me a few benefits, right? I can go to the annual shareholders meeting. Um, I have access to Packers only uh, owner merchandise. And a lot of what I was saying uh, in the piece is I think there's a better use for NFTs than what we're seeing right now. Uh, you know, I, I sort of described it as something that rich people might buy to, to show off, um, to claim to have some ownership over things. But because tokens are non-fungible and you can prove on the blockchain who owns it, um, a lot of ways they can be uh, like a ticket to get into something that can be instantly verifiable. So um, if I want to put it on Twitter, I know we interact on Twitter, right? You can now put an NFT into your, your picture on there. Uh, when I tweet about the Packers, about how disappointed I am in the loss, uh, everybody might be able to see and verify that I'm in fact an owner of Packers stock. Um, I might be able to buy an NFT in the Packers or the, the New Orleans Pelicans, and I might get access to exclusive merchandise, whether uh, in person or virtually. Um, I might have access to uh, specific things online where I can go talk to the coach, talk to the players um, that would only be possible because I have an NFT and they could verify that I'm a season ticket holder or I purchased this NFT or something like that. I think that's a real exciting part about what NFTs can do for the future of sports, not just the sort of collectible nature of it that we've seen so far. Yeah, you talked about it earlier. Um, there's This stuff has its own language. Obviously, it's cutting edge tech stuff, so it has kind of a techie, nerdy, wonky cult surrounding kind of thing to it. You talked about Orange Pilled earlier. 
<laughs> is part of what's going on here, though, is there needs to be a normalization of the language barrier of this instead of just talking about NFT and blockchain, comparing like, oh, this is like buying a stock or this is like buying memorabilia. Do you think that's part of a cultural change that needs to happen for this to be more of a mainstream thing and not just that weird thing we see on social media? Yeah, I mean, definitely uh, younger people have picked up uh, that in the nomenclature very quickly. But I think if these things are going to go broader, it's definitely going to uh, take some educational efforts. Um, you know, I think that's going to fall incumbent on uh, teams, companies, you know, whoever to sort of break it down for the for the individual people, right? In the same way that smartphones were, you know, this weird thing that people had 13 years ago, and and now we're we're used to it and things like. Twitter or TikTok or Instagram are things we're all really familiar with. Um, you know, that said, there's definitely a bit more of a learning curve here because so many, so much of the talk net technology is decentralized. You can't just go to one place and they sort of have a, a one size fits all explainer for it. But um, I think people start to pit, pick it up. And, you know, this technology is, is barely a few years old, um, especially in the NFT space. Yeah. Talking to Eric Peterson, um, <laughs> you ended your piece in tech dirt that we've been talking about. Uh, with NFTs and other things, you end up talking about the decentralized ownership. Uh, DAO is the acronym for decentralized ownership model. Uh, we know the history of this, though. Uh, things both in business and in government regulation, they decentralize and they get regula- regulated, then they centralize and they decentralize again. There's a cycle and a pattern to these things through history. How is that pattern going to play out, do you think, with this new technology? Because obviously, you know, Congress is going to start looking at this. We already talked about Russia and China and other governments are looking at things like Bitcoin. They're going to look at this NFT stuff. They're just going to because that's what they do. How do you see that cycle of decentralizing and then regulation coming into it playing out with this new technology? Yeah, it's a good question. Um, You know, Wyoming yesterday was actually just looking at their laws on decentralized autonomous organizations. So um, once Wyoming continues to be a leader um, in this space, um, you know, I don't think that government will actually do that much uh, with these sorts of organizations, if I'm totally honest with you. Um, I, I think a lot of them is are figuring out the way that laws work. Uh, for example, people bought a NFT of Dune and thought that gave them copyright ownership of Dune, um, and they quickly found out that was not the case. So, um, you know, in a lot of ways, our current laws are, are built to deal with these sort of organizational structures. Um, you know, might just take a little clarification around the edges. I think the, the better question is how private organizations are going to deal with these sorts of structures. Um, I, I give an example of um, ownership of sports teams through these decentralized organizations, right? The Packers are a kind of model about this, but they still have a, a board that makes a lot of these decisions. I sort of uh, wondered what it would be like if a team was really just owned by the fans um, who had, had purchased stock and were able to make some of these decisions. Um, and of course, the NFL has rules that prevent those sort of things from happening. But, you know, we're seeing new sports leagues pop up all the time, whether it's the United States Football League giving it another try, um, you know, whether it's smaller leagues, whether it's women's uh, based leagues that are starting up. Um, I think some of these organizations are really going to take a take a look at these different sort of ownership models as a way to build up fan interest and fan involvement. Um, and, and frankly, to uh, disperse some of the financial risks of you know spending millions of dollars on something that might not work out. So I, I think I'm more interested in what the private government side will say about these sort of organizations rather than what government will say about it. Yeah, talking to Eric Peterson. Okay, we've been beating you over the head with terms we don't know. Let's get to something more <laughs> relatable. Uh, you are a New Orleans fan. It's been a rough couple of days for New Orleans sports fans. Uh, Sean Payton is leaving the Saints. Uh, the Pelicans are up and down. There's other things going on. What is the state of mind of the New Orleans sports fan today as you sit there? Yeah, um, I, I think they're really grateful for the time they had with Sean Payton and Drew Brees. Um, as they look at the the Saints salary cap situation and the draft pick situation, uh, they had been mortgaging the future for quite some time um, for the ability to keep that window open and compete. And, you know, they've been one of the most successful franchises for the last decades. And I don't think the the Saints fans would trade that for anything. Um, that said, I, I think they're really um, know that times are going to be tough, at least for the next few years, but I think there's more belief in the organization than there has been some time that the, the current ownership structure and the current decision-making structure will be solid. Um, but a lot of people are putting on their Joe Burrow jerseys and, uh, you know, really rooting for him as the playoffs move forward. I think that will um, give a lot of folks something to root for. And I'm really excited for that Bengals Saints game. 
in New Orleans next year, I am sure it will be the hottest ticket in town. Yeah, uh, Eric Peterson, proud Louisiana dweller. Uh, we were kidding him a little bit, but Louisiana is a wonderful, unique place in America. If you've never traveled there, you need to go there. Not just New Orleans, uh, upstate, the bayous, the coastline, all of it. One of the great food places. You know we're big on food here. One of Absolutely. the great food places in all of the world. Uh, Eric, appreciate your time today so much. Tell people what you got going on. Pelican Institute, you're also writing with young voices all over the place, doing media like here on Herd. Tell, let people know where they can find you on your social media and what you got going on. Yeah, they can find me at Eric underscore Peterson underscore or at Pelican uh, Institute dot org. Um, also, it's king cake season. So order a king cake from your favorite bakery down in New Orleans. I promise you will not be disappointed. Yeah, if nothing else, when you go to New Orleans, if you just do beignets and king cake, you'll leave happy. Everything else will work itself out. Uh, Eric Peterson, thank you so much for the time, my friend. Uh, returning guest, and we'll have you back again soon to explain more of this stuff that I don't understand very well. Okay. Look, looking forward to it. Uh, thank you, sir. Good job. 